Today I thought, today I thought um, I'll focus on innovation, but particularly how knowledge management, managing knowledge of the people, how that helps innovation. May I ask, in your view, what do you think is one of the four most important innovations of mankind? A lot of people will say it's fire, but fire was already there. Um, some people say hunting tools, but stones were already there. Personally, I think one of the first or greatest human innovations is the wheel. Because it requires creation of knowledge and application of that knowledge to actually make a wheel. Because wheels didn't exist on the seashores or anywhere else. So somebody has to think about it, about the concept of wheel, and actually innovate that, and so on. So I regard that as one of the greatest and for the first innovations of mankind. People say it's about 6,000 years ago when humans started making wheels. We moved far from that. <laughs> And today, our innovations are at really, really growing at rapid pace. We got our gadgets, we got televisions, phones, watches, and you know, at the foremost and probably you could say one of the greatest human innovations now is probably the International Space Station. Okay? We moved quite a bit from that to actually here. Everything is great. So what about this knowledge management stuff? Why do we need to do that now? We didn't need to do knowledge management then. Nobody has actually asked, well, go to that website um, or look at these concepts, learn, and uh, then produce a wheel. Why do we need to do knowledge management or anything like that now? Why is it important? The problem today is a single individual cannot produce all of these aspects. It requires collaboration. Not only knowledge creation and application, but it requires knowledge creation, sharing that knowledge with other people, other organizations in many instances, and then applying it to innovate. So that's quite a lot. And because it requires a number of people and organizations to create world-class products today, organizations, whether it's universities, Apple, Microsoft, Mercedes-Benz, they require to manage knowledge in a formal way, in a systematic way. And that helps to uh, these organizations and people to produce great stuff. The other problem uh, of today is obsolescence. Okay. Um, a few years ago, probably until 1990s, guys in research and development teams somewhere locked up in uh, laboratories created ideas, produced stuff, and then the products came out. The marketing and sales guys went into the world to sell those products for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the same product. Could you do that now? The rate of obsolescence, which is the products going outdated in basic terms, the rate of obsolescence in some of the technology products now is about 5% per month, cumulative. So within a year or two, whatever great product you produce becomes obsolete and out of date and ends up there. Okay, so what does that mean? That means institutions, companies need to produce new products, innovate on a rapid pace, continually. That requires knowledge creation on a continual basis. And that's quite important. Not only that, it's not just guys in R&D locked up in a lab who produce new knowledge now. It's how you interact with your customers how you solve problems, how you identify new market patterns, and a number of things. It's not just R&D problem anymore. Just to give you an example, uh, when I was growing up in India, um, for about 20 years, the only one car was available in the market. One car, just one car, one model, Ambassador it was called. For 20 years, they sold the same model car, just one car in the whole Indian market. That's all I could remember. Now there are probably 300 in the market. Uh, in, in European mar markets, it's quite high. So the markets have changed. The requirements of knowledge creation and therefore innovation have changed. 
and we need knowledge creation at rapid, rapid pace, organizing the human knowledge at, in a very systematic process, and then applying it to produce great stuff like that. So how do we do that? How do we good, do good knowledge management? Okay. Um, I have done about five or six years of research work on how to do knowledge management across a number of global corporations in Germany, India, and United Kingdom, looking at how global large organizations create, share, and apply their knowledge. And there were quite interesting patterns. There are three key elements that really helps knowledge management. There are three core components and there are three requirements. The core components obviously have been saying create new knowledge, share it, and apply it for the benefit of your organization and yourself. So what are the three components that makes knowledge management work? One is culture. You need to get your organizational culture right. We'll go through what it means because it's quite easy to say, get your culture right. Yeah, but how do we do that? The second aspect in knowledge management is process. You need to get your organizational processes right. And finally, infrastructure. When I say infrastructure, it's not just about technology. It's about physical and other infrastructure that goes in. So the three key aspects to do great knowledge management and therefore to innovate better is culture, process, and infrastructure. Let's look at culture. A culture of a company, or a university, or a charity, or a country, all of these is quite critical. What kind of, how do you treat your people in your organization? For example, if you say, you know, a couple of people, your coworkers, are chatting in the corridor, and say, what are you doing in that corridor? Go back to your computer screen, go back to your office, and go to work. If that kind of culture exists, forget it. Knowledge management, knowledge sharing is not going to happen. Why? Because you don't know what they're discussing. They may be discussing a recent customer problem. Innovation is not just about creating new products. Innovation is how do you solve problems in a new ways? How do you actually do things in new ways? And of course, invent new products. So if you treat people like that, if you have a culture where there is no flexibility, there is no that informal knowledge sharing flexibility, then it's a wrong culture. So you need to encourage people to develop those informal networks, to develop those informal knowledge sharing attitudes. Okay? Um, out of the companies I, uh, I've studied, like Mercedes-Benz, Hewlett-Packard, Oracle Corporation, National Health Service, every organization I have studied during my research work in knowledge management, everybody said only probably less than 1% of innovations happen in real formal meetings. Have you ever come across a meeting where, end of a meeting, yes, we invented this product through this meeting. It just doesn't happen like that. Innovations happen in people networking, sharing the knowledge informally. Because if you go to a, you know, sharing a coffee with a colleague in a canteen and say, <laughs> I had this great problem today. This customer is pestering me to modify this product. And the design guy might say, while sharing the lunch, well, we could actually change our product. That may be good for other customers as well. Innovations happen like that. All the global corporations, every one of them said 90% or 99% of innovations happen through informal knowledge sharing. So why do we force our people to go and look into the computer screens? Right? Burying under the computer into the computer screen doesn't create innovation. It's helpful, of course, you need to do day-to-day -day jobs, but Organizations need to have culture where it motivates people, it gives the time and flexibility for the people to actually share knowledge and create those new ideas through those informal networks. That's quite critical. And organizations which don't do that will end up probably like Nokia today, where they were the number one mobile phone company, where are they now? They're trying to produce you know, product from 20 years ago to, to make a comeback. Anyway, um, so, it's a culture that's critical. Of course, you need to pay well. But what you may not realize is people don't share knowledge because you pay them well. A lot of research shows that it's appreciation, it's acknowledgement of people's contribution much more important than actually rewarding for developing a new idea. 
In the initial days of knowledge management, a lot of companies, do you know what they did? They said, right, we're going to do knowledge management now, guys. This is early 2000 and so on and so forth. What we do is, um, let's collect all the PowerPoint slides of the company. Let's upload these ideas into the website uh, we have, the company website. And we'll give you air miles for every presentation you upload. Or we'll give you cash if you upload this thing. <laughs> they actually thought it would work. And they, those were ideas they, they came up with. And then a lot of garbage went on to the knowledge portals or companies' websites because it's useless, because there is no quality control. There is no um, people who are just uploading for the sake of it because they will get a couple of air miles. What people realized as knowledge management as a discipline um, matured is it sees not the actual um, money, it is not the actual rewards, it is the praise, it is acknowledgement, appreciation of people contributing, sharing the knowledge with others, coming up with new ways of doing things. So that's where process comes from. So you need to have not only the right culture, you know, where you actually give the flexibility, time, provide good rewards, recognition to people, but processes are also important. What do we mean by processes? Let's say um, one of the big engineering firms just finished a great project, multi-million dollar project, went successfully, and so on. Another example, another company created a product that utterly failed. It's crashed in the market and so on. After those things happen, you need to learn from those. Whether it's success or failure, you need to learn from those. And your organizations need to have processes to actually capture. Not documenting every detail, but you know, tell, tell us the story, Bob. You developed this product, it's failed, we know that. But tell us the story why it happened and how it happened. Similarly, success stories. Capture both success and failure stories and create the process in such a way that whether it's a project, whether it's a, um, a great product or failed product, your organization captures what went into it and build those processes so that you, you create knowledge from that so that people don't repeat the same mistakes or people do good things that, uh, or learn from good things that, that went on. So that's quite critical. The processes are there. Infrastructure. Um, again, a, a pretty good story here. Um, one of my, um, when we're doing some research work in knowledge management, um, we studied an oil company, um, pretty global oil company, who actually thought, again, the computer's knowledge engineering approach, where they wrote programs, they looked at oil exploration patterns, all the best practices that went into oil exploration projects, um, they interviewed geophysicists, chemists, and everybody, and they wrote very good programs um, and you know, develop the software system and a computer. So for about five years after they developed the system, they kept asking the computer, putting all the data, uh, geophysics data and so on, would we find the oil in this site? Should we explore or not? The computer says no. And in sometimes the computer said yes. So where the computer said no, they didn't drill. Where the computer said, yes, there could be oil, they, 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 they drilled. So if it didn't work, it's the mistake of the computer, because it's the computer who said it's nobody's decision. OK? So everybody thought it's a risk-free approach. Let's bring in the computer. <laughs> For about five, six years, they actually didn't find a single oil site. OK? So what they did is uh, they basically threw that computer in the sea after five years, and they went back to their people and say, Right, let's work, go back to the model of actually people say, look at the data, use the computer as a tool, but not a decision maker. And then within six weeks, they found an oil site. Now, computers, technology, infrastructure are tools. They are not decision makers, they are decision supporting tools. There's a lot of talk that in five years, 70% of the jobs is done by robots, computers, and things like that. Yes. They will, they will have more share in terms of the lot of stuff done. But could you imagine um, going to a computer for diagnosis of a cancer or um, treated by a computer prescribing drugs to you? Would you go and see, well, go to a restaurant to be served by a robot? Um, while it is true that the role of computers, robotics would improve, but they are not going to be decision makers or decision um, decision making tools, the, the tools rather than decision makers. So, infrastructure is quite important. The next bit of infrastructure is quite, when I say infrastructure, it's just not technological infrastructure, like knowledge portals, there's database systems, there are a lot of good technologies that are helping. 
But this particular technology is also quite helpful. It's a water cooler, okay? Why is that helpful in knowledge management, knowledge creation, and innovation? How many times you have observed people catching up for a coffee or near the water cooler talking and discussing about organizational matters? That could be sometimes gossip, but many times people discuss things, share knowledge around water coolers, okay? There's a research done that water coolers, cafes, informal corridor meetings, actually about 80% of organizations knowledge is shared through that. So not only your technological infrastructure, you must focus on your physical spaces, how your organization is designed, your office spaces are designed. Whether you have water coolers, don't throw them because it wastes organizational time, uh, because it doesn't let people to hit targets. It's actually their essential tools so that these things enable people to crisscross, people from different areas to talk, people from different areas to meet and share knowledge so that new ideas, new ways of solving problems, new products come out of those organizations. I haven't seen in 15 years of my service ideas created in meetings. Very rarely they happen in meetings or committees. Okay? They are quality control systems, not idea generation systems. So it's quite important that those three aspects culture, process, and infrastructure become great components of a knowledge management infrastructure. So, it took 6,000 years from going from wheel to that International Space Station. Things have transformed. The tools we use have transformed. Probably pe people might have used just stones and some sticks to actually make a wheel at the time, but we need a lot more. Of course, we can't do and share knowledge similar way the people or ancestors did 6,000 years ago. We need tools, we need technologies. But the central aspect is the culture of your organization. If you don't have the right culture, it's not gonna be happening. So culture, process, and infrastructure are critical. Culture means people, okay? So we don't need to uh, go too, too deeper into that. So transformation has happened. We will transform our lives even further. Will, humankind will go even further, but the way we manage knowledge, the way we innovate, one thing won't change, that's people. Thank you. <laughs>